Today's topic, parenting and gender equality with a very special guest. He encouraged his daughter to get an education, but then one tragic day she was shot by the Taliban on the way to school. Now he fights for gender equality for all girls throughout the world. I'll introduce you to our guest right after this. Hi, welcome to the Zada Show. I am Naska Zada. Zia Din Yusufzai is an education activist from Pakistan. He protests the abuse against women by the Taliban and fights for women's rights and education. He's the co-founder of Malala Fund and the author of Let Her Fly. Let Her Fly is about the journey of a boy growing up in a tiny village in Pakistan who became an activist for peace and equality. Zia Deans is the father of the youngest ever recipient of Nobel Peace Prize, Malala, who is one of the most influential and inspiring young women on the planet. Zia Deen Yusufzai, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Nazka. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here. I know you are so busy promoting your book, let her fly. I absolutely love it. I just finished reading the book. Um, I want to start with your journey at the beginning before all of that. Um, so obviously let her fly traces the inspirational journey from Shangla, your home area to you breaking traditions and also prove that there are many faces of feminism. Tell us about your early activism and also how it started. Uh, thank you so much. So, uh, like I was born and grew up uh, in a small village in the northwest of Pakistan. And I remember that uh, it was a typical uh, patriarchal society and a very uh, patriarchal family. I had five sisters uh, and um, like under the same roof, we had two different sets of uh, my brother and I, we were the favorite or the like uh, the uh, superior members of the family. You had and privilege. Yes, the privileged members of the family, including my father and my five sisters, like in terms of food, clothing, uh, like uh, uh, we had more pairs of shoes, more pair of clothes. Uh, we had better food uh, while my sisters and my mother used to eat the leftovers uh, or the food, like, like, like the poor parts of the food, mm -hmm. you can say. Uh, and you also had more had freedom, worst, right? Yeah, and also like the worst discrimination uh, or inequality that my sisters suffered was the deprivation from education. Uh, I was sent to school, my brother was sent to school, and none of my five sisters had, a, had, an, opportunity, had an opportunity to go to school. Uh, it had two reasons. Number one, there were not many schools for girls, like hardly any school. And number two, uh, my parents had big dreams uh, for me uh, and for my brother, uh, but uh, for my five sisters, their only dream was to get them married as early as possible. So I grew up in such a patriarchal family. Uh, and then uh, later on, I could see that one of my cousins was bound in a forced marriage. And she could not come out of that uh, marriage because of the social pressure and social taboos. Uh, and that really changed my mind, changed my thoughts, and changed my heart. Uh, and I was very... Um, angry that why uh, like girls and uh, women are not given free freedom why they why 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 don't they have uh, control over their bodies or uh, why they are not why can't they make decisions for themselves um, and that was the thing that uh, like right from the very early age like when uh, I, I was 17 18 years old even at that time, I wrote a long poem 
uh, and I made a commitment in my dead poetry that I will stand uh, for girls' rights, for women's uh, rights in their education. And as you mentioned, uh, that I was kind of feminist even before I had heard this word feminism. Okay, and you lived in the area where Taliban had control and you have Islamists there and so much going on. How did you fight against, how did you do it? Was it hard? Was it, tell us about that part. Because I remember yeah. my father was doing the same things for us in Northern Iraq, but it was so hard even for him just some, sometimes to, to defend us or to say, oh yes, they're going to school. Tell us about your experience. Yes, like uh, in spite of the uh, patriarchal and uh, traditional society, uh, we had a lot of girls in schools. Uh, like in big towns, girls' education was uh, very, uh, like uh, many girls were going to school. But when Taliban started their Talibanization in 2005 and 2006, it was the hard time that we had ever seen in our life. Uh, my five sisters did not go to school, but uh, my my big dream for my daughter was that she will be a different girl. She will be an independent girl. She will be herself. And for me, the the the, the only way to see her independent, to be herself, uh, that was education. And while she was in grade uh, four or five, Talibanization started and um, uh, Taliban started propaganda against girls' education on their FM radio. Uh, and uh, uh, late to Tehran, they became more and more violent. Uh, and then they started bombing and destroying mm -hmm. schools. And they destroyed more than 400 schools. Mm -hmm. So that was the time uh, that I just changed from a teacher to somebody who was fighting for the right of girls' education. Yeah. And that was the time that Malala, from being like a student or like a normal student, uh, she had to raise her voice for the right of education. Uh, so uh, really, the Taliban time was the most difficult time uh, because uh, they had girls, they had it girls' education. Uh, and uh, in 2000, uh, at, at the end of 2008, uh, like uh, in 2009, January, then they uh, just made an announcement on their FM radio that no girl will be allowed to be going to school after 15th of January 2009. And that was like class dismissed. That was like the end of the end, end, end of girls' education. And 50,000 girls, like you can see now that how many girls were in school, 50,000 girls were deprived from uh, their education. Uh, so we had to stand for the right of girls uh, at that very time uh, against Talibanization and standing for the right of girls' education. And that created a problem for you, you and your family. In 2012, Malala was shot you know, for standing up to uh, Taliban by continuing to go to school, right? Tell us about that day. Uh, of course, that was the most difficult day in our lives, uh, in my life as a father, and then in our lives as a family, uh, because M Malala was not only my daughter, she was my friend, she was my comrade. Uh, and uh, in our home, like in English, they say like father, like son, but in our home, it was like father, like daughter. Uh, and. Um, uh, that day when I heard that she had been attacked or the bus had been attacked of the school, uh, really the very retrospection of that day is so traumatic, to be honest, uh, because even I forgot to cry. Uh, and then uh, that day I was in press club and I was about to give a speech to the teachers. Uh, and then somebody told me that the school bus has been attacked. Uh, I didn't know that who has been attacked but I got so scared. I just gave a short speech and then I later on I knew that uh, um, Malala and the two other girls with her, uh, they, had been, uh, they had been shot. Uh, and uh, then I straight away went to the hospital and from, then from one hospital to other hospital into other hospital. Uh, and that's quite a long story, but finally uh, we uh, had to move to the UK for further uh, treatment and for further 
uh, recovery of her uh, health. Mm -hmm. And now you have a campaign because you believe in education. You believe education is important. Uh, tell us about that campaign. What's going on? Yes, of course. Like you see, education is something uh, which is a very uh, children are girls and boys in the West are in the developed world. They take it for granted uh, because they don't know uh, about the girls and boys who every day struggle to have a pen and a pencil and a piece of paper, a notebook and a teacher. Um, for me, education is more than just reading uh, or writing or uh, to learn few languages. Uh, it is emancipation, it's freedom, it's independence. It changes you. So education has changed me. Uh, it has transformed my inner being. And I must say that it has made me beautiful inwardly. So that's why I'm a strong believer of education and especially for girls. If we want change for girls, if we want girls to be independent, education is a must. It is prerequisite. Without it, we can't do it. So that's why my campaign in Pakistan, when I was a teacher of a school, uh, of a small school at that time, like uh, I was a great like uh, a be believer of education in my community. Uh, but you see, uh, at that time, I was uh, a leader in the SWAT uh, for girls' education as a campaigner. Uh, but things changed. Things drastically changed when Malala was attacked. Uh, uh, it, it changed our lives. Uh, and the girl who was speaking uh, for 50,000 girls in the Swat Valley, now she's speaking for 130 million girls who are not in school. So this is, I mean, uh, the, 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 the tragedy are the, uh, that happened to us uh, it was God's decisions and people prayers, whatever I can say, but uh, it changed it into a great opportunity for girls' education. And now, uh, as you mentioned, uh, we have the Malala Fund, uh, which is uh, a great organization and foundation for girls' education. We worked for mm, 12 years of free, safe, and quality education. Uh, and right now, uh, we are working uh, in almost 10 countries where most I mean, where girls, uh, the number of girls uh, are, are, are much in, much number, are more number of girls are out of school. Uh, we are working in Afghanistan, we are, we are working in Pakistan, in India, uh, in um, a Syrian uh, re re region like in Jordan, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, and uh, uh, we want to see every girl in school in every part of the world. That sounds really good. And I am a true believer in education because if I it was not for my father, just like what you did for Malala, that that was um, insisting that I get education that I could have never um, gotten the education. Right. I want to talk about raising Malala. How is it like to um, raise a Nobel Peace Prize winning daughter? Tell us about that experience. Uh, that is <laughs> in, in a difficult question, uh, I, I mean, uh, at, at the same time. I personally think that I never thought uh, while she was growing up or when she was born uh, that she will be one day that uh, famous girl or a Nobel laureate. I just believed in her. I wanted to see her uh, an independent girl. I wanted uh, that she should have a life different from my five sisters. Uh, who, like in patriarchal societies, I tell people that uh, many girls and women, they die as they had never been born. Uh, so I wanted that she will have an ident identity of her own. And that was the reason that uh, when she, she was born, I named her after the Malala of Mevan, who was the legendary uh, Pashtun, uh, hero, heroine, and she was known for herself. Uh, and then my cousin brought me the family tree a few weeks after when Malala was born. Uh, and when he showed me the family tree, it, they were all men. And the family tree was traced back to 400 years, and it was a long list of men. And what I did, I picked up my pen, and I wrote, I, I drew a line from my name, and I wrote Malala. So these were small 
uh, feminist moments of my life, uh, which made Malala's life different. Uh, and I tell people, they don't ask me what I did, rather ask me what I did not do. I didn't clip her wings. That is the most important message that I can impart to the world, uh, that especially girls in patriarchal societies, where men feel like insecure care or somehow they are always uh, like feel that uh, uh, girls and women should be in their control uh, and they should not be going to school, they should not be free, they should not be going out of their four walls. I mean, I tell them the one thing that you can do and you want, and, and if you want to change your life and if you want to lib liberate yourself, it is a liberating experience for yourself as well. Uh, that you don't clip the wings of your daughters. Let them be themselves. Uh, and the second thing, like which I did as a father, right from the day one, that I always encouraged my daughter. I, uh, I had no difference in my sons and in my daughter, and I appreciated her small achievements, uh, her small activities, if she spoke something beautiful, if she said something beautiful, our, 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 our small homework, our school ass ass assignment, our small speech, I said, wonderful, you are great, you are unbelievable. And those small words were big for my child. And that's why, I mean, um, like, this is what I have learned as a father from my own experience. Okay, and you also have two sons. I want to ask you about how do you think about raising your sons compared to Malala? Do you? They are difficult a little bit compared to her. Uh, raising no sons choice. are, my experience is they are uh, more difficult. Maybe Malala is uh, like a good child. That's why now she's not a child. She's 20, 22 years old. I know. Uh, as, a, as, a, as, as a young girl, uh, she was uh, like very disciplined and uh, uh, very poised and calm and always focused on her studies. Like, like a very young girl when she was in kindergarten in grade one, uh, uh, every day or uh, every second day she used to wash her socks and her scarf. Uh, so she was very neat and tidy. She was a very sweet student. And until now, while she is in Oxford, she is so focused. She is the best student I have, I have ever seen in my life because I have been a teacher for 18 years. But about my boys, I mean, I love them. They are great. Both of them uh, are different. Like all my three children are different from one another. Um, and uh, my old son, Khushal Khan, I had some difficult times uh, with him when we moved from uh, Pakistan to the UK because there was a big cultural change. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, in the beginning, I wanted Kushal, my older son, to be a son like me. Uh, as I was very uh, ob obedient to my father, so I wanted to see that kind of ob obedience in him, but it was not working. Uh, he had Xbox and a controller, and he was playing on it, and it was stressful for me. Uh, but then I got the help of a friend uh, and she was so helpful. She became the godmother of my sons. And uh, Khushal, my old daughter's son, he came out of that phase. And now we are the best friends. Oh, uh, if yes. he shares with me everything. And a few days ago, uh, he had his uh, uh, secondary, like A-level exams. And he did not do his mathematics paper well. And I was in Vancouver at that time. And he called me on phone. Uh, Father, I'm so upset i am so hopeless and uh, you do a lot for me uh, but i won't be able to make you proud because my oh. mathematics uh, examination was so poor and i told him look uh, because i was uh, very concerned about the a, a young boy sometime uh, i hear about the stories in pakistan in other countries that some boys not always but when uh, parents put great burden of expectations on them or they make themselves to be uh, someone uh, who could be extended mm -hmm. a lot from, and then they do, don't do good in examinations, they commit suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got scared that, oh, if he is unhappy, then I told him one thing that, look, Khushal Khan, if I learned to love you unconditionally, you should learn to be loved unconditionally. Oh, wow. And he was so happy after that. So, I mean, 
Yeah. Parenthood is something that uh, a different edge for girls and boys. You have to be uh, playing it accordingly mm -hmm. uh, at different times. So, uh, and I tell people that parenthood is an everyday effort. Every day you make an effort to be a good father and to be a good mom. Um, so uh, both of my sons, they are great uh, and I love them. And uh, my older son won uh, and he has like re 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 received uh, an offer from a very good university. Uh, and the younger one, he's a bit cheeky and he doesn't like uh, reading and studies uh, much, uh, but he's very smart mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he is doing his GCSC. Uh, but both of them, uh, they have no pressure. Uh, they are living their life. Uh, and we are a family that uh, if you come to our home, and you are welcome to come. Uh, oh, we're going to we, England. <laughs> we, we, we believe in happiness. Uh, the, the, the core value of our family is happiness. Uh, and the values that we believe in brings happiness. There is freedom. Everybody can express oneself. There is love. There is respect. The most important thing is respect. And I tell people that our children do what we do, not what we teach. They learn what we do, not what we teach. So if I want to impart in my children the value of e equality, the value of respect, they can learn how I treat my wife. They can learn and how my wife treats me. So that is kind of leading by example. So that is so simple. If you want to see in our children, uh, the beautiful values of e e equality, justice, truth, respect, uh, believing in di di diversity, uh, I think uh, uh, that could be learned in the family institution. My belief is that uh, there are a lot of great moments in history. They are now like uh, suffragette and now me too and many other there are great organizations who are working uh, for uh, bringing gender equality for for everyone uh, but one institution that is informal and that is everywhere in every corner of the world that is family if we change families we change everything oh that sounds really good uh, we're going to go to a serious topic now from that to extremism in pakistan I want to ask you about the best way to deal with extremism in that country. I will say education. And if you ask again, I will say education. <laughs> and if you have hard time, I thought I will you say, might say that. <laughs> but every time I will add the word quality education. Quality education. You're not talking quality. about madrasas, right? No, I'm just kidding. No, not at all. Because uh, I have said this many times that better to be illiterate than to be indoctrinated. Uh, like the, in the Ill, Ill, illiterate uh, farmers, peasants, uh, masons, carpenters, they are much more useful for their societies. They contribute a lot to their societies and uh, though they are not educated with the formal education, but the so-called indoctrinated literate, they are really harmful for their communities, for their families, and for themselves. So quality education is the answer, one word answer, uh, that if we want to fight against extremism, uh, fight, uh, fight, fight against uh, terrorism uh, in any part of the world, it's not only about Pakistan, whether it's of Afghanistan, it's Pakistan or Syrian re 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 region, or even here in the de developed countries, uh, I think uh, we should uh, work on the curriculum of our children. But how do you we... do that if you have Pakistan case, for example, the government is not functioning well, you have extremisms, you have all these different groups trying not to um educate people have proper schools like you said what's like very briefly what's the best way to deal with it how do you you dealt with that there was like no school for girls and secretly malala had to go to school so what what's the best way to educate then i think uh, that was taliban time because girls education is not a taboo in pakistan there are hundreds and thousands of girls who are going to school uh, I, uh, uh, but extremism, I mean, that is the challenge. 
uh, extremism could be fought uh, through education and uh, for the incumbent government now, Imran Khan's government, I mean, they had seven points at agenda uh, before uh, they came into power and education was one of them. And it was one of the top, uh, like the, 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 the uh, great uh, priorities of the government. So, I mean, I am a Pakistani citizen. I can ask them, I can request them that, uh, yes, uh, there are uh, like uh, strategic politics, uh, there is America, there is Iran, there is Saudi Arabia, there is Afghanistan. But if we want our future generations to be safe, uh, if we want peace and prosperity in our country, uh, we have to inculcate in our children quality through quality education. We have to teach them like uh, plural, plural, pluralism, uh, uh, respect for other faiths, uh, colors, and caste and creeds, which is so important. Mm -hmm. And um, Yes, but it needs a pol political will. Yes. If uh, you want to appease everyone, uh, because there are r religious pol political parties, uh, and uh, 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 their strength is madrasa students, uh, they, uh, 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 they, they, they have nothing to do uh, with the future of those young boys and girls. They are uh, ties for them. They use them for their pol political ends and these children uh, who are like a, a, a street power of the religious political parties uh, if they are not included in the mainstream education if they are not uh, taught the basic skills uh, for the market exchange uh, like a, 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 a boy who qualifies a madrasa he is unable to work uh, uh, in, in a computer lab uh, in a, a hospital uh, like, uh, uh, like the only thing he can do is uh, to lead prayer in the mosque, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So our children deserve these madrasa children. Uh, they deserve skill, life skills, uh, and uh, it needs political will of the government uh, to take into confidence uh, all those parents and even the re re religious le leaders. Uh, to tell them that don't destroy the future of these young kids uh, and let them live their life, let them have their happiness, and don't use them for, uh, for, their, uh, uh, for your own vested interest and for your own pol political interest. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my last question will be about, do you prefer coffee or tea? We normally finish the conversation uh, like that. <laughs> <laughs> Cappuccino, cappuccino. Cappuccino, <laughs> coffee <laughs> then. <laughs> yeah. Zayedin Yusufzai, thank you so much for this great interview. Thank you so much. Thank you for have, having me. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I'm one of your uh, biggest fans. Um, I appreciate this interview. Um, thank you so much for watching. If you liked this interview, please make sure to click the like button and also subscribe to our YouTube channel at The Zada Show. And also be sure that visit our social media and um, Instagram, Facebook, and also Twitter. Until next time, um, thank you so much for watching.